Can you tell a place has a dark history just from looking at it? I'm gonna show you a listing and we're gonna see. Also, this is a series to so follow along. This is the Watts family home in Colorado where Chris and Shanann Watts lived with their two children. Chris Watts is a family annihilator who took the life of his pregnant wife and two daughters in 2018. And despite all that, this house actually recently sold. But in the listing that was posted, you can actually see areas that were featured in the police cam footage during the investigation. Because when the crime first happened, Chris pretended he had no idea what happened to his family. But you can see in a lot of this footage, he's acting so suspiciously. So much so that one of his neighbors actually tipped off to police that he thought something was just not right with Chris. We still don't know from Chris exactly why this happened, but we can infer that he wanted to start over a new life with his mistress. Chris is currently in jail, but a new family now lives inside that home. Would you be willing to live in a home like this? Blood curdling facts that you wish you never knew. Part 8. Pigs will eat literally anything. There are stories of pigs entering farmhouses and eating newborn babies. Speaking of babies, doctors believed that they didn't feel pain until 1987. So they would operate on newborns without anesthesia. Whistling was a way in which people would summon demons in ancient times. In 1968, every single TV in America shut down for 25 seconds, and there was a sound broadcasted on all of them that many believe was the devil's voice. People born deaf with schizophrenia often see disembodied hands signing them as opposed to hearing voices. A mysterious skeleton only 6 inches long was discovered outside a ghost town in Chile. It was declared to be human and lived for as long as 8 years. This is Charles Lee Ray a Chicago-based serial killer better known as the Lakeside Strangler. He was shot and killed inside this toy store after a long shootout. Before dying, Charles used a voodoo ritual to transfer his soul into one of these good guy dolls. That doll ended up in the hands of six-year-old Andy Barclay. The doll, now going by the name Chucky, went on a killing spree which involved the deaths of Maggie Peterson, who was struck with a hammer and fell out of a window, Eddie Caputo was killed when his house exploded with him still in it. John Bishop was killed due to a voodoo doll being stabbed in the heart. Dr. Ardmore was stabbed in the leg then electrocuted. Chucky, having now become a human in doll form, was eventually shot in the heart and killed. Let me know if you'd like to hear more of this bizarre story. This Polish woman is claiming to be the missing Madeleine McCann, but did you know there's age progression photos done of Madeleine that could help us know what she would look like today? In 2007, Madeleine was taken from her family's bedroom while they were on vacation in Portugal. And immediately the parents came under fire because they did leave the kids asleep in the apartment by themselves while they went to dinner with friends. This is the official age progress photo of Madeleine to age nine, and this is the woman who's now claiming that she is Madeleine. And this woman does have some of Madeleine's signature features. Here you can see a black speck that looks like a pupil in Madeline's eye, which is something they both share. She's also claiming that she has a lot of missing memories from childhood, but the eye spec does seem to be her most convincing argument. But German prosecutors actually believe that Madeline is no longer alive. And two people believe they saw this man carrying a small girl towards the beach around the time that Madeline's parents first noticed that she was missing. But that being said, it's not completely impossible that she would be alive today. Haunting facts about serial killers that you'll want to forget, part one. After raping his blindfolded victims, the Golden State Killer would be super quiet and pretend like he was gone, and right when the victims would try to untie themselves or go for their phone, he would scare the hell out of them. Jeffrey Dahmer attempted to make sex zombies out of his victims by drilling holes into their head while they were still alive and pouring acid into the holes. American serial killer Albert Fish once cooked and ate a little girl and sent a letter to her parents describing how she tasted. Colombian serial killer Pedro Alonso Lopez raped and murdered over 300 girls. He was in prison for 18 years when he was moved to a psychiatric hospital where they declared him to be sane and he was set free, even though he stated that he planned on killing again. He was released in 1998 and no one knows where he is or what he's doing. This is Art the Clown. He's a demonic killer clown with mime-like qualities who appears on Halloween night to wreak havoc. Anyone with chorophobia may want to scroll on to another video at this point. His crimes include mass murder, kidnapping, mutilation, and torture. His clown makeup differs to that of stereotypical clowns as it's all in black and white. He is usually seen carrying a black bin bag around with him, which he usually keeps his weapons inside of. His most noticeable outfit feature is the bald cap and tiny black top hat he wears atop his head. Art is perhaps one of the most sadistic and violent serial killers out there. 
he'll literally stop at nothing until he's butchered you. And he'll even use some of his supernatural powers if need be. He never speaks or screams even when he's in pain. Instead he simply mimes the actions of screaming and crying. No one knows if he can't speak or just chooses not to. Make sure you don't book this clown at your kid's next birthday party. 2018, this firefighter passed away from supposedly drowning, but five years later, watch how the story takes a turn. Jesse Reed, who was a firefighter, was found in the Tennessee River along with his Jeep after his wife Mary Ellen reported him missing back in March 2018. The medical examiner at the time said that he suffered blunt force trauma and passed away from drowning. But oddly, no one was ever held responsible for Jesse's death. As we know, we always look at the people closest to the victim. And and five years later, Mary has been closely investigated. Not only has her story been extremely inconsistent, she told investigators at the time that her and Jesse went trail riding, but she couldn't recall a two hour time period between leaving the house and getting to the trail. And not surprisingly, Mary tried to collect Jesse's life insurance payout as soon as he passed away, but the judge said, nope. Jesse's friends and family have been waiting years for answers, so they've kindly asked me to share his story so that we can get more eyes on this case so please like and share so we can help the reed family ate the world's hottest potato chip for a tiktok and died that was legitness yeah. i'm harris Woloba, a 14 year old american boy and i should never have eaten that potato chip on friday september 1st i was at school when i decided to go and buy this unusual green potato chip sold by pocky for ten dollars each it was marked on the packet as being forbidden to children and pregnant women for views, I was prepared to do anything, because on TikTok, the fashionable trend is to film yourself eating this potato chip and try not to react. My mother was called a few hours later because my stomach was so upset. She took me home. I seemed to be getting better, ready to go to my basketball practice, but I collapsed all of a sudden. The paramedics couldn't do anything to save me. My mom said that even though the autopsy hadn't been carried out yet, she was sure I had died from the potato chip. This challenge, very popular on TikTok, is called the One Chip Challenge. While no one has yet been declared dead because of this challenge, many people have been sickened. What do you think of this kind of dangerous challenge? Would you put your life at risk just for the sake of a few views? Have your say in the comments right now. Mm. Demons are real, at least according to Reddit user Sunshine Pumpkin. She was walking up and down the center aisles at her grocery store when all of a sudden she saw a man who was standing in the middle of the aisle. At first glance, there was nothing wrong with the man. That was until he turned around and looked at her. When he turned around and looked at her, his eyes were solid black. Not just the pupils, but even the whites of his eyes. Reddit user Sunshine Pumpkin then says that she felt immense fear. She felt terrified. She says that she was so scared that she literally ran all the way to the checkout lines, checked out, and ran to her car in the parking lot. Says that she's never felt that feeling of dread that she felt that day in the grocery store. The fear that was put into her just by looking into this man's eyes. She says she's 45, and she's never experienced fear like that. So what do you guys think? Was this a real demonic encounter? Was it a trick of the light? Let me know in the comments down below. This woman called 911 just minutes before she was murdered, but dispatchers hung up on her. Brittany Zimmerman was 21 years old, living in Wisconsin in 2008. She was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and lived with her fiancé nearby. She actually lived very close to the police station. On April the 2nd, Brittany would place a call to 911. However, dispatchers stated that they didn't hear any sounds of a struggle on the line and hung up. This would prove to be a fatal error. When her fiancé came home later that day, he would tragically find her brutally stabbed and strangled to death on the floor. Her fiancé was ruled out as a suspect and police were left clueless. They had absolutely no leads as to the killer's real identity. Years later, in 2016, there was a breakthrough. Police found DNA evidence belonging to David Carl. This was a man who was now already in prison for DWI charges. When police questioned him, he stated he had seen her the day of the murder, but hadn't killed her. Then there was another development. A man called Andrew Skulls, who had previously been in prison with David, told police that David had actually confessed to the killing to him. It looked like Brittany's family may finally have closure. Then another tragedy. 
Andrew Scholes was killed in a motorbike accident. Any potential information that he may have had about this was now gone forever. Finally, in March 2022, David was eventually arrested and charged with the murder. He pleaded guilty and he said that he was under the influences of substances when he forced his way into Brittany's home. He will likely spend the rest of his life in prison. The death of Lil Peep is always a story that makes me sad. So if you don't know who Lil Peep was, he was a songwriter, a rapper, a producer, musician, and he helped kind of pioneer the emo trap movement. So Lil Peep, whose real name is Gustav, really shot to stardom in 2016, 2017. He had been making music for a long time before that, but it was in those years when people really started to notice him. He started appearing on the covers of magazines, and he amassed a huge fan base. Now, I actually was gonna go see Lil Peep a night or two before he died. He played in Texas and I was gonna go see him, but I remember saying to my friend, oh, I'll catch him the next time that he comes to town, but sadly that didn't happen. So on November 15th, 2017, Lil Peep was in Arizona. He was playing a show in Tucson that night, but nobody had really heard from him for a while. And at that point, the tour manager headed onto the tour bus to see what was up with him. And that's when he discovered the already lifeless body of Lil Peep. The official cause of Lil Peep's death was an overdose. At the time of his death, he had Xanax, fentanyl, marijuana, cocaine, tramadol, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, and oxycodone and oxymorphone, which is an absolutely insane amount of drugs in his system. But it's some of Lil Peep's final posts on Instagram on the day of his death that are really haunting. In this video, posted only a few hours before he would go on to pass away, Lil Peep is seen dropping an unidentified pill around his mouth trying to swallow it. Obviously, I can't show the video here because I don't want this to get taken down, but it really is haunting. And shortly after this, keep in mind this is the day he died, he made this post that said, When I die, you'll love me, featuring him performing on stage. Sadly, he would pass away only a few hours after posting this. There's no doubt that Lil Peep fundamentally changed the music industry and he would have been one of the biggest stars of today if he were still with us. I still miss him a lot. I still listen to his music all the time. And yeah, this is just a very, very sad story. The judge in this case said the actions of this one man were like that out of a horror film. Christina Prodan was 27 years old. She was in a relationship with Joseph Porter after meeting him on Facebook. He moved into her apartment in Minnesota in 2017. However, Joseph was not actually single when the pair got together. He was married to a man. It is reported that when the pair got together, Joseph and the man were either broken up or in an open relationship. Worryingly for Christina's family, there were red flags at the start of their relationship. Once he moved in, he became violent. Shockingly, he actually awed Christina at one point and also massive trigger warning here for animals. He allegedly beat her dog and disturbingly was accused of killing a puppy back in his home in Arkansas. In December, not long after he moved in, Christina actually had to take out an order of protection against him. The pair broke up but ended up getting back together shortly after because we all know that abusive relationships are really difficult to break free from. Christina's family knew about the violence that she was enduring, so they were very concerned when the pair had reunited. After not hearing from her daughter on January the 5th, 2018, Christina's mum was concerned. She rang police and asked that they do a welfare check. When police arrived at the scene, the place was an absolute mess and Joseph and Christina were nowhere to be found. When police ran the details of Joseph's car through the system, they found out he'd actually been pulled over the night before. Eerily, Joseph was driving alone with a large suitcase in the car with him. Not only that, he had a pickaxe and a shovel. Christina remained missing. Days later, Joseph was spotted by police again. An officer found him sleeping in a car with burns all over his face. Police later would find out that this car he was sleeping in was stolen. During this time, police were obviously investigating Christina's disappearance. Interestingly, her phone had been turned on in the same area in Arkansas that Joseph was found sleeping. Her phone had been pawned at the local Walmart. CCTV showed Joseph going into that same store and he was arrested. He eventually confessed to killing Christina. He had brutally killed her by choking and beating her after an argument. He had tried to burn her body, hence the injuries to his face. Christina's remains were collected and Joseph pleaded guilty to unintentional murder. 
he got 20 years in prison. Look, I'm gonna say this once, and I'm not saying it again. Part her fucking thighs and release all that chaos from her mind. Fucking amateur. So the man that you just saw in that creepy TikTok video was 28-year-old James Lee Bonewitz. And on June 23rd, 2022, he stabbed four people and killed two of them in Indiana. Now, before all this went down, James didn't have a colorful criminal history. He seemed like he was just your average guy. And he spent a lot of time posting here on TikTok on his account, OneWits, an account which to this day is still up. Now, I couldn't really find any information on why James carried out these crimes, but he did. So on the night of June 23rd, the police in town got a report of a suspicious man at a local store. Apparently, this scraggly-haired man was inside of the store holding two orange-handled knives, but before the police could arrive, he left in his sedan. Then, security camera footage captured him parking at a gas station and exiting his vehicle. And for some reason, he walked over into a neighborhood, entered people's homes, and started stabbing. Sadly, a couple would die in the stabbing. Caitlin Huddleston England and her husband Danny England. Now, Caitlin survived the initial stabbing. She was transported to a local hospital where she was pronounced dead. But on that evening, Danny was found on the back porch of the home with a massive laceration in his chest and a deep cut in his arm. And he was already dead when authorities arrived. But that wasn't enough for James. There was also a man that they discovered in the back door of the home with multiple cuts all over his body who had been stabbed multiple times. His name was Bo Williamson and he survived the attack. James had also stabbed another man, this time in the bathroom of the house. This man was identified as Terry Solomon II and he had cuts all over his abdomen. Terry would eventually tell the police that he heard his neighbors screaming, he had rushed over to help, and that's when he was attacked by James. So I tried to find as much information about this crime spree as I could, but I couldn't really figure out exactly why James had carried out this crime spree. At the end of the day, he had viciously stabbed four people and two of them had died. And after he had stabbed all of them, he had gotten in his vehicle, driven away, and he was discovered by police the next morning hiding out in a field covered in blood. So James would eventually sign a plea deal and admitted guilt to all of the crimes. And he was eventually sentenced to 85 years in prison, which means he's more than likely going to die in there. I just don't understand exactly why this crime happened, but it really is a tragedy. And now this couple's children, because of one man's selfish actions, will never get to know their parents. Also, if you want to hear more true crime stories just like this one, be sure to listen to the podcast that I co-host with my wife, Courtney, Murder in America, available now on all streaming platforms. This guy literally got away with murder for years before eventually murdering someone in his hometown, using her bank card and getting caught. Israel Keys appeared to co-workers as a perfectly normal guy and loving father to his young daughter. He lived with his daughter and his girlfriend and worked hard at his construction business. In reality, Israel Keyes was a cold-hearted killer and on February 1st, 2012, he committed his final murder. Samantha Koenig was just 18 years old when she was working alone at a coffee stand in Anchorage, Alaska. Israel Keyes walked in, held a gun to her head and kidnapped her. He told her that it was just a kidnapping for ransom money and that he'd eventually let her go. He took her phone and messaged her boyfriend to say that she'd be staying with friends for a couple of days. Only, he never had any intentions of letting her go. Israel took Samantha back to his house, and with his girlfriend and daughter asleep inside, he took her to his shed, where he raped her and then strangled her to death. Sickeningly, he then left her body in that shed for two weeks while he went on a cruise with his family. When he returned from his cruise, he had the intentions of blackmailing Samantha's family for money, saying that she was still alive. Only when he opened the shed, he realised that this was going to be more difficult than he thought, as her body had started to decompose. What he did next shows just how sick this guy was. He did Samantha's makeup, brushed her hair, propped her up against the shed wall, and sewed her eyes open with fishing line to make it appear like she was still alive. He then took a picture and sent it to her parents, requesting $30,000 ransom money. Thinking she was still alive, Samantha's parents did what he said and they transferred the money. Only the police were one step ahead and they were tracking the card that he was using. They used CCTV when he withdrew the money and they tracked his vehicle down. Israel Keys was arrested and Samantha's family soon learned that she was no longer alive. Israel had actually dismembered her body and dumped her in a frozen lake in Alaska. 
In interviews with police, the true horror of Israel's crimes soon came to light and he admitted to multiple murders across the country from as far back as 2001. Police believe Israel is responsible for 11 murders, including this couple in 2011, Bill and Lorraine Courier. Israel admitted to abducting and murdering Bill and Lorraine and their decomposed remains were found at a farmhouse. Sadly, the families of Israel's victims never got justice as he took his own life in his prison cell while awaiting trial. He'd used his own blood to draw this and leave it in his cell. These skulls are thought to represent his victims. Ron Nivea O'Neill was just nine years old when she was brutally murdered in her own home by her father, with her brother watching in horror. Due to her medical issues, she couldn't scream, beg for her life or run for help. On March 18th, 2018, 911 received a call from this man, saying that he'd been attacked by demons and he'd killed them all in self-defence. In actual fact, he was talking about his ex-partner, 33-year-old Kenyatta, and their children, nine-year-old Ron Nivea and eight-year-old Ronnie. He gave police the address and then hung up. When emergency services arrived, they could not have prepared themselves for the horror that they found. Kenyatta was laid in the driveway with a gunshot wound and extensive injuries to her head. The garage door then opened and this man appeared. It was Kenyatta's ex-partner, Ronnie O'Neill III. He was absolutely covered in blood, as you can see. He was told to get on the ground, but he didn't comply, so he was tasered, and he was then placed in a police vehicle. Nine-year-old Ronnie then appeared at the front door. He had horrific injuries. He had burns and stab wounds, one of which had actually made his intestines protrude through the skin. He identified his father as his attacker and said that he'd also shot his mother. Ronnie was rushed to hospital for life-saving surgery, and officers then entered the property. They found a small fire which was extinguished and when they looked beyond this, they found a trail of blood. This trail led to the body of nine-year-old Ron Nivea. The absolute terror that this girl experienced before her death is just horrific to think about. She was born with cerebral palsy, so used a wheelchair, and she was also autistic and non-verbal. Family described her as a beautiful, caring young girl with a positive spirit. Ron Nivea had been attacked by her father using a gun and a hatchet and what makes this even more horrific is that her brother, eight-year-old Ronnie, had witnessed the whole thing. Ronnie actually testified in court against his father and told the court how he'd watched as his father had attacked his sister with the hatchet, hitting her in the back, the back of the head and the face and neck. Ronnie said that his father had then lit a tissue and used it to burn his sister's body and all he could see was tears running down his sister's face. Ronnie then described how his father had then turned on him and held him down while trying to set him on fire. He'd managed to break free and run to the kitchen, but his father followed and grabbed a knife, and then he stabbed him multiple times. Ronnie said he'd managed to break free, and that's when he saw flashing lights outside and ran to the front door. Ronnie O'Neill was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. Eight-year-old Ronnie made a full recovery and was actually adopted by one of the detectives that worked on the case. Detective Mike Blair had formed a special bond during Ronnie's recovery and he's now a permanent member of their family. This mysterious case absolutely does not sit right with me. Someone knows something and has not come forward. On the 12th of July 2015, 18-year-old Tiffany and her parents attended a graduation party in New Jersey. At around 9pm, one of Tiffany's friends spoke to her parents and claimed that they were really annoyed because Tiffany had used their debit card without permission. Tiffany initially denied this to her friend, but then did admit this to her mum, Diane, a little bit later. At this point, they were all outside Tiffany's house and Diane went inside to find her husband. When she returned outside of the house, Tiffany had vanished. Now they were able to see Tiffany on the deer cameras that they had outside the house. She appears to be walking down the driveway in her normal clothing and white headband. When they tried to find Tiffany, they actually made a terrifying discovery. Her phone was lying on the floor at the bottom of the driveway. Immediately they knew something was wrong as Tiffany never had her phone out of her sight. 
At 11.30 p.m. her family called the police. Little did they know 27 minutes earlier Tiffany had been hit by a train. Frustratingly, pretty much straight away, police presumed this death to be a self-unaliving. However, that just didn't seem to fit with the evidence presented. All of Tiffany's family and friends said how much of an upbeat person she was and that she was really happy at the time. She was making plans for the future and the autopsy also showed that she had a clean toxicology report. Now in the deer cam footage, she was fully clothed, but when she was found, she was just in her underwear with no shoes on. Upsettingly, two weeks after her death, Tiffany's mum actually found her missing trainers and headband more than a mile away from the track. Could someone have murdered Tiffany and then dumped her body on the train tracks to make it look like she did this herself? Tiffany's parents certainly think so. They definitely suspect some foul play was involved. This is the disturbing case of the child who killed a child. In July 2018, six-year-old Alicia McPhail was abducted from her bed. She'd been staying with her grandparents in the Isle of Butte. She'd gone to sleep watching Peppa Pig and no one had any idea of the horrors that would unfold that evening. Meanwhile, 16-year-old Aaron Campbell was drinking with friends at his house. Aaron apparently became upset in the night because he had been arguing with his mum. He had had a challenging upbringing involving physical and emotional abuse. Aaron decided that that evening he wanted to get some substances to smoke from a couple that he knew. The couple in question were Alicia's dad, Robert, and his girlfriend. They'd been known to sell substances to Aaron previously, but he could not get hold of them. Intending to go and steal them off them, Aaron armed himself with a knife. He headed to Robert's house where he lived with his parents and girlfriend. This was obviously where Alicia was staying that evening. When he arrived at the house, he noticed the six-year-old sleeping in her bed and took the opportunity to snatch the poor defenseless young child. Disgustingly, he carried her to a secluded location, s aid her and then killed her. He then disposed of his clothes in the sea. At 6am the next day, Alicia's grandparents woke up to discover that the little girl was missing. They straight away alerted police and locals. When the family asked Aaron to keep an eye out for the little girl, he texted them back saying, oh damn, I'm sure she's not went too far. A local man soon discovered Alicia's lifeless body around 15 minutes away from her house. Along with a lot of the local community, Aaron's mum actually checked her CCTV of her house. She was hoping that this would help with the investigation and it definitely did. She saw her son leaving and returning from the house that night and she handed the evidence over to police. Aaron was arrested and it was discovered that the clothes that he'd abandoned on the beach did actually match with his DNA. This case made me terrified to go to the cinema. This is the case of the horror in Screen 9. James Holmes was raised in California. His mum was a nurse and his dad was a scientist. From a young age, he was experiencing night terrors and allegedly actually tried to take his own life when he was just 11 years old. He was apparently obsessed with guns and weapons and had dreamed of becoming a mass murderer. Between May and July 2012, he legally bought four guns. Background checks were conducted and he was allowed the weapons. He also bought spike strips, which if you don't know, pop the tires of cars if they chase after you. On July the 19th, just hours before tragedy would unfold, James mailed his notebook to his psychiatrist. Inside the notebook, James detailed his plans to kill. The notebook was actually discovered later on undelivered. Just prior to entering a cinema in Aurora, James rang a crisis line to tell them about his plans to kill. However, the call was disconnected after just nine seconds. At the midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises, CCTV captures James walking into the cinema. He walks into screen nine, props open the door and then walks back out again. Shockingly, he goes to his car and gets guns out and gas canisters. He re-entered the screen at about 12.38pm and set off two gas canisters. When he entered screen 9 again, he immediately opens fire on the audience, instantly killing 10 people. 
Two others later died in hospital from their injuries. An additional 70 people were injured. This was an absolutely packed out cinema. James also shot at people as they scrambled to exit the screen. His youngest victim was a six year old girl. Witnesses said this all unfolded as there was actually a gunfight on the screen and initially they all thought it was special effects and just part of the film. Police were actually on the scene very quickly after the first 911 call. James surrendered to the police and was arrested in the car park. He was apparently very, very calm when he was arrested and told police that he had booby trapped his apartment. When police investigated his apartment, this was found out to be true. He was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences.